This is Lesson 19.5, The French Revolution, The Declaration, and the October Days of 1789. Same question as before, how did the events of 1789 result in a constitutional monarchy in France, and what were the consequences? And we're still dealing with the French Revolution, Topic 5.4, Explain the Causes, Events, and Consequences of the French Revolution. And we're expanding a little bit, aren't we? We've got this top part right here. We're repeating that. The French Revolution resulted from a combination of long-term social and political causes, as well as enlightenment ideas exacerbated by short-term fiscal and economic crisis. So we're going to see more of that. But also we have this, the first or liberal phase of the French Revolution established a constitutional monarchy, increased popular participation, nationalized the Catholic Church, and abolished hereditary privileges. We're going to see some of that today. And then this one also, women enthusiastically participated in the early phases of the revolution. However, while there were brief improvements in the legal status of women, citizenship in the republic was soon restricted to men. Place is still France. The time frame is August to October or so, 1789. I've said this many times before, I just want to repeat it real quickly. I have used many different sources for these lessons on the French Revolution, but I want to give special recognition once again to the great courses Living the French Revolution and the Age of Napoleon by Professor Suzanne Dazan. You can listen to this book from Audible. It's well worth it. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. In the old regime Europe, it was like this. Your rights depended entirely upon what group you belonged to. Individual rights didn't exist. And there are many examples of group rights. Just in France, for example, the clergy had the right not to pay taxes. Some towns and provinces paid less taxes than others. Catholics had more rights than Protestants. Some peasants didn't have the right to move at all. They were still serfs, but others did. Caribbean slaves had no rights at all. Jews had no right to own land or work many kinds of jobs. There were many rights that no one had at all. No one had the right to publish freely. No one had the right to free speech. No one had the automatic right to a fair trial. And no country, not even England, had universal rights. And we talked in Lesson 16.5 about how anti-Catholic the English Bill of Rights was. Enlightenment philosophes impacted how people saw rights in two ways. Number one, they theorized about concepts of natural laws and natural rights coming from those natural laws. For example, Voltaire, in particular, wrote passionately about Protestant rights. And they viewed society in terms of individuals rather than in terms of groups. So the next logical question would therefore be, what rights does an individual have if we aren't looking at what group he belongs to? These rights would have to be universal. You also had the impact of the American Revolution. In France, the American Declaration of Independence and the various state constitutions were very popular reading. Many of our revolutionary state constitutions listed individual rights long before our U.S. Constitution did. Virginia's Constitution in particular was inspiring to the French for this very reason. By 1791, the United States had a Bill of Individual Rights to the Constitution. In America, we had a Constitution that laid out the governmental structure first. But in France, the liberal deputies of the National Assembly, led by Lafayette, decided to begin their constitution with a Declaration of Rights rather than end with one. Guess who Lafayette was working with as he was finalizing this Declaration of Rights? Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was in France. Thomas Jefferson, the author of the American Declaration of Independence, was at this very moment serving as the U.S. Minister to France. He was already campaigning to his American colleagues by correspondence to add a list of individual rights to the U.S. Constitution. And he was helping Lafayette finalize a French Declaration of Rights in the summer of 1789. Everybody in France admired Jefferson, whether they were conservative monarchists or liberal patriots. 
and Jefferson actually helped to mediate between the two parties. And many felt that if the U.S. could be a great example to the new hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere, then France could be a great example to the universe. The monarchists argued against giving people more rights, and it's important to examine the arguments that they used. First, they said giving people more rights would encourage the people to make unreasonable demands and even become violent. Also, they said you couldn't compare the U.S. to France. France was 1,400 years old. The U.S. was an infant nation. The U.S. had no trace of feudalism like France did. The U.S. had no social hierarchy, if you're willing to ignore slaves and Indians. By August the 26th, the National Assembly agreed on a preliminary draft of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. This would serve as the beginning section of the new French Constitution. Let's summarize the context for the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. You had Enlightenment ideals, you had the American example, and you had opportunities provided by the French Revolution itself. And the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen has been in and out of various French constitutions throughout history ever since. For example, France, during the Nazi takeover, didn't have it. What was actually in those 17 articles of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen? Well, first, the word man. This implied universality. It wasn't just particular men or certain groups of men. And the word citizen implied that men were not just subjects, but participants in the political process. The French people started addressing each other as citizen and citizeness. And if you read A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, you'll actually see this depicted. As we know, the American Declaration of Independence specified three natural rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizens specified four natural rights, liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. The 1793 version of the Declaration made this last one the most important, saying that insurrection was more than just a right. It was a duty whenever the government violates the rights of the people. In this day of protest in the United States, when our country is going through an awakening regarding racial injustice and seeing the need for and the effectiveness of protest, you can see why we in this class right now are exploring the ideas of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in such detail. This is also an indication of why the French are so famously quick to take their dissatisfaction with their government to the streets and angler, angrily protest, for the French, it's a duty. A few years ago, there was a TV show about this very topic, and a French person made this comparison with the U.S. She said, in America, people are afraid of the government. And if we're willing to admit it, we are afraid of our government. We see arrogance and we see disregard for public opinion we see mass incarceration keep your hands in sight is the advice we get for when we're pulled over by the cops government officials and police doing and saying whatever they want on video without a care in the world about the consequences these things make us afraid of what the government has the means and the will to do to us but this French person said, in France, on the contrary, we make sure that the government is afraid of the people. And that's how it should be. And I'm not suggesting that the French have all of their social issues worked out. Far from it. History shows that there is no magic bullet for protecting individual rights. But we can learn from each other, and this is why we're studying the French Revolution in so much depth. Some of the individual rights spelled out in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen are these. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom from arbitrary arrest, equal access to public offices, equality in taxation, 
freedom of religion. And this last one, this one is the most hotly debated topic of all. Article 10 gave freedom of religion, but limited it to provided it does not disturb public order, unquote. Freedom of religion in context. France had about 28 million people at this time. About 800,000 to 1 million of those were Protestants. Divine right of kings was no longer the political reality in France due to the French Revolution. Before, the Catholic king got his right to rule from the Catholic God, and any non-Catholics had th therefore been held in suspicion. But now, the power to rule came from the nation, so divine right of kings didn't hold Protestants back anymore. France also had about 40,000 Jews. Jews took a couple more years to gain the rights of citizens in France. Jews were seen as foreigners. They were seen as having greater loyalty to their tribe than to the country that they just happened to be living in. And Jews were seen as having a different set of morals that they lived by. Some legislators predicted that if you gave the Jews the rights of citizens, non-Jews would rise up and kill them all. And those who argued for Jewish rights made the kinds of arguments that we've been talking about. Society wasn't made up of groups anymore. It was made up of individuals, and individuals have individual rights. In fact, one deputy argued it like this, we must refuse the Jews everything as a nation, and we must give them everything as individuals. Some argue that if you emancipate the Jews and give them the rights of citizens, you'll make them more French, which was a good thing. Some deputies called for rights that did not make it into the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. For example, the right to subsistence, food for the poor, the right to education. The Catholic Church was traditionally responsible for providing these two things. But many wanted to transfer responsibility for these two things, subsistence and education, to the state. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen claimed that sovereignty, the right to rule, rested in the nation. It didn't mention the king at all. Citizens had the right to participate in making the law. It said the main purpose of government was to guard and preserve rights. And all of these things in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen shocked the rest of Europe. It was an attack on the old power structure. Problems with the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Number one, to whom did the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen actually apply? Was it just free, property white men? Was it just active citizens? Was it just those who paid taxes? What about poor men? What about women? What about religious minorities? What about free people of color? What about slaves? So the big question, did declaring rights for some create a system of logic that made it inevitable that these rights would be given to more and more people when doing so became more socially and politically possible? Let's look at our own American history. We talk a lot about the hypocrisy of our founding fathers, and there was hypocrisy. We live in a time when people are reevaluating many public statues and memorials and changing the names of military bases and colleges and even sports teams. Did our slave-owning founding fathers see down this path toward truly universal rights when they amended the Constitution with the Bill of Rights and swore solemn oaths to defend that Constitution? 10 to 15 percent of General George Washington's Revolutionary Army was black. Washington wasn't necessarily happy about it. But he was desperately short-handed, and he needed to compete with the British Army, which was offering freedom to slaves who would fight for them. Most of Washington's army units were integrated. 
George Washington's writings show that he had the vision to see that the Bill of Rights would someday apply to everyone and that Washington actually supported abolition in theory. Check out this quote from George Washington. There is not a man living who wishes more sincerely than I do to see a plan adopted for this abolition of slavery. But there is only one proper and effectual mode by which it can be accomplished, and that is by legislative authority. George Washington wrote that in 1786. In fairness, Jefferson wrote quite similarly, but did nothing. Washington actually explored ways to reduce the number of slaves that he had at Mount Vernon without selling them. Selling them would not free them, and emancipating them outright required lots of cash, which George Washington did not have, and it also had many legal stipulations. And he made this quote, were it not then that I am principled against selling Negroes as you would do cattle in the market, I would not in 12 months from this date be possessed of one as a slave. George Washington, 1794. Most of the ideas Washington thought of for paying for the emancipation of his slaves involved renting or selling land. But Washington died at the age of 67 before he was able to put any of his ideas into action. We generally think that setting slaves free is a simple matter of right versus wrong, and that is, of course, the central and primary issue, right or wrong. But it was actually much more complex and complicated than that. When George Washington died, his will freed all of the 317 slaves on Mount Vernon that he was legally able to free, and this amounted to 123 of them. But the rest belonged to either his wife, Martha, or had belonged to Martha's previous deceased husband. And when Martha died a couple of years later, her will likewise set as many slaves free as she was able to. But the rest of the Mount Vernon slaves went to the grandchildren of Martha's previous husband's family. In order to legally free slaves in Virginia, you had to provide pensions for the elderly ones, and you had to provide education and training in useful occupations for the younger ones. And all this was even more complicated by the fact that many of these slaves, with all of these various legal fates, had married each other and had families together. Washington was very aware that being a slave owner was going to tarnish his legacy. Washington's emancipation provision in his will was widely publicized and celebrated by abolitionists and African Americans. Richard Allen, the formerly enslaved founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, gave Washington's eulogy. And in his eulogy of Washington, Allen declared that Washington, quote, dared to do his duty and wipe off the only stain with which man could ever reproach him. He has watched over us and viewed our degraded and afflicted state with compassion and pity. His heart was not insensible to our sufferings. And that's Richard Allen's eulogy for George Washington delivered in the Bethel Church, Philadelphia on December 29, 1799. None of this is to justify the father of our country, George Washington's ownership of other human beings. The point is that the evidence shows that the framers of the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution with its Bill of Rights could see the end of slavery coming. They could see the eventual universal application of individual rights to all Americans and they consciously constructed the wording of these documents in anticipation of that day, even if they were unable, or worse, unwilling, to take action in their own time. And the framers of the French Constitution may have had the exact same purpose in mind when they wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. The October Days, also known as the March on Versailles. This is yet another one of these events that we teach about without a good, clear understanding of three important things. The context, 
the actual events as they went down, and how the situation was different afterwards. And this always made me feel uncomfortable and frustrated with the subject. Below is a great website about these events. Let's have a quick recap of the events that have led up to this point. You had what was called the August Decrees, generated by the National Assembly. And these consisted of two things. The abolition of feudalism, that went on from August 4th to August 11th, and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen from August 27th. Then you had September and October, and this was a time of tension and frustration for the people of France and of Paris in particular. Why? There were eight factors that contributed to this feeling of anxiety. Number one, the king didn't seem very excited about these August decrees. The people of Paris found this disturbing and confusing. The people of Paris were highly suspicious of the aristocracy, as we saw in the Great Fear, but they respected the king and even the queen. What of all this reluctance on the king's part to go along with the August decrees was because those no-good aristocrats and ministers of his at court were messing with his head out there at Versailles. What if we got him out of Versailles and back into Paris with his people where he belonged? No French king had lived in Paris for about 70 years, and this foot-dragging earned them both the nickname Monsieur and Madame Vito. Number two, by mid-September, the conservative monarchist party and the liberal patriot party had hammered out a compromise between themselves in the National Assembly regarding the new constitution. They agreed that the king would not get an absolute veto like we talked about in Lesson 194. Instead, the king would get a suspensive veto. And this meant that the king could delay a piece of legislation for up to four years by not signing it. In exchange for getting a royal suspension veto, the monarchists had agreed to a single house, a unicameral legislature. So the monarchists didn't get the bicameral legislature that they had wanted. And this would have created a house of elite conservative deputies for them. The king was once again assembling royal troops at Versailles. Was the king planning on doing something to the National Assembly? Number four, the price of bread was going up again. The harvest of 1789 had been much better than that really bad 1788 harvest. The price of bread had gone down a little bit, but now it was going back up again. Where was all the grain from this good harvest? People were getting tense again about the notion of powerful forces hoarding grain. Number five, censorship of the press was now over. And there were 140 new newspapers just in Paris. And many of those were quite radical. And one of the most radical was called The Friend of the People, edited by Jean-Paul Marat. And we're going to learn more about him. In his newspaper, he accused the Paris Commune, the city's new government, of hoarding grain to force the prices up. Well, the Paris Commune demanded that Marat take it back and apologize, and Jean-Paul Marat brazenly refused, saying, I am the eye of the people. You are at most its little finger. Number six, the wives and mothers of Paris were getting impatient. Getting food for the family was considered women's work in France at this time. Women did all the buying and all the selling in the food markets of Paris. And women who sold food in Paris were called fishwives, even if they sold butter or eggs or vegetables, etc., other than fish. Every year, on August the 25th, these fishwives went out to Versailles to pay homage to the queen. They visited the queen when she gave birth to her first son, and she threw them a banquet. The market women of Paris thus had the king and the queen's ear, and they could convey to them the needs of the people of Paris. Number seven, the National Guard, commanded by Lafayette. The National Guard, which we learned about in Lesson 194, had three major duties. Number one, protect shipments of grain. 
Number two, keep the peace. And number three, defend the city of Paris from attack. It consisted of about 30,000 troops, of which 4,800 were full-time professionals and the rest were part-time volunteers. Lafayette trained and drilled them. He also designed their uniforms. And one of the most important parts of the uniform was the red, white, and blue tricolor cockade. So that leads us to the next question. What in the world is a cockade? Well, this is going to be important. A cockade was a circular badge of fabric. It often had a ribbon attached to it. Its colors represented some cause or a country with which you wanted to declare your identification and your affiliation and your support. And you would wear a cockade on your hat or on your sash or just about anywhere. The cockade of the revolution was the tricolor red, white, and blue cockade. And the cockade of the French royal family was white, and the cockade of Austria, Marie Antoinette's home country, was black and yellow. And you've got some pictures of some cockades right here. You've got the Austrian black and yellow cockade, you've got the tricolor revolutionary cockades, and the French royal white cockade. Number eight. Finally, there were, once more, ugly rumors. On October the 2nd, many radical newspapers reported that the King's Royal Guard at Versailles had a huge, rowdy banquet the night before. And Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were there, and the troops had toasted the King, but they had not toasted the new nation. They had worn the royal white cockade or the Austrian black cockade instead of the tricolor cockade of the revolution. And some said that they had trampled on the revolutionary cockade. And it was all very suspicious. And all of these radical journalists got the people very stirred up. This event is often called the Orgy of the Bodyguards. And you can see on this picture the trampled cockades on the floor. On October the 6th, thousands of women took to the streets of Paris and they stormed City Hall and they got lots of pikes and two cannon, but they had no ammunition. And then they marched the 12 miles to Versailles. There were 6,000 to 8,000 of them and they marched the entire way in the rain. The fishwives of Paris were in the lead of this march. And when they got to Versailles, they disrupted the whole National Assembly, which was conducting business at the moment. They shouted down the speeches with cries for bread. They mocked the deputies. They gave speeches of their own. They hung their wet clothes everywhere to dry. They made a picnic out of the Assembly's food supplies. They insulted and threatened the conservative deputies with violence although no deputies were actually hurt or killed. No deputies, that is. Bren and politics combined in this event. There had been bread riots before, but these women also understood the political situation. They knew the king was resisting the National Assembly's revolutionary decrees, and they knew who the conservative politicians were by name. They knew which ones were the monarchists, and they knew which ones were prominent clergy. Guess where the king was when these women got to Versailles? Out hunting, of course. This time he was called back to the palace, and Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette thought about fleeing from the palace. But about 7 p.m., he decided that he could salvage the situation. Louis XVI met with a group of women who were serving as a delegation from the crowd, and the king promised them that he would supply Paris with grain the very next day. The group went back to the crowd and reported the news. By that time, it was already too late to walk back to Paris, so most of the crowd decided to spend the night at Versailles. About 10 p.m., Louis XVI met with the National Assembly, and he had promised to agree to the August decrees of August 4th and August 27th. As a quick reminder, the August 4th decree was the abolition of feudalism, and the August 27th decree was the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Back in Paris, the National Guard met to decide what to do about what was going on in Versailles, and Lafayette decided to take 20,000 men to Versailles and restore order. 
and he arrived at Versailles about midnight. And Lafayette tried to convince the king to move to Paris. There, in Paris, he could protect the king, and the king could serve his people better in Paris. But Louis XVI refused to make any more decisions, at least that night. The next morning, the crowd pushed its way into the palace courtyard. And once again, a royal guard member fired into the crowd and killed a teenage boy. The crowd was furious and they stormed into the palace itself. They killed two royal bodyguards and in terror, Marie Antoinette fled her own bedroom and ran into the bedroom of Louis XVI. Apparently, they slept in separate parts of the palace. And in this picture, you can actually see Marie Antoinette running like crazy in the background while Lafayette talks to the fishwives in the foreground. Lafayette took his National Guards into the palace and restored order. He located the royal family, and Lafayette did three things to save this volatile situation. Lafayette took the royal family, kids and all, out onto the balcony, facing the crowd in the courtyard. And Louis XVI addressed the crowd and promised to move to Paris, and the crowd cheered. Still on the balcony, Lafayette gave his revolutionary cockade to a royal guardsman who put it on in front of the crowd. Then the members of the royal guard who were present all did the same with cockades that the National Guard had given to them. And this was a visible way of showing that the king's royal guard supported the revolution. Finally, Lafayette got Marie Antoinette to appear on the balcony with just him. Marie Antoinette was terrified of doing this, but Lafayette insisted. It was very uncertain what the crowd was going to do. And Lafayette bowed to the queen and kissed her hand in front of the crowd. And that got the crowd to start cheering, long live the queen. I mean, if this, quote, hero of two worlds, as he was known, endorsed the queen, then maybe she was okay after all. But Marie Antoinette never forgave Lafayette for putting her in that position, hated him for the rest of her life. Lafayette was trying to mediate between all of these various different forces, the king, the deputies in the National Assembly, his own National Guard, the king's royal guard, the journalists of Paris, the Parisians in the crowd, in particular, the market women of Paris. These people were not only hungry, but they were also very politically aware. They knew what politicians held what opinions on the issues. On the afternoon of October 6th, there was a huge procession that went back to Paris. Tens of Thousands of people walked with it. There were men and women and National Guards. There were 60 cartloads of grain for the people. And Louis XVI and his family rode along in the royal carriage. And there were courtiers and there were bodyguards and there were deputies. What did all of this say about the French Revolution? There was a back and forth between the streets of Paris and the National Assembly that was driving this revolution forward. Ordinary market women forced the king to quit stalling and agree to the National Assembly's August decrees and to the future constitution. Within a few days, the National Assembly also decided to move from Versailles to Paris. And this whole event was also a new opportunity for Louis XVI if he would just take it. He had the favor of the people, he was bringing bread to the city of Paris. The market women were happy. But Louis XVI was not happy at all. His royal authority was being decreased by the revolution. His sacred status was being severely curtailed. On the outside, Louis XVI pretended to go along with the revolution. He and Marie Antoinette moved into the Tuileries Palace in the middle of Paris. The National Assembly moved into a huge riding stable right next to the Tuileries Palace. Behind the scenes, though, Louis was working to undermine the revolution. 
in Paris, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette began to do things that made them appear distant and arrogant. They hardly ever went outside the palace. They didn't host balls or parties or concerts anymore. Marie Antoinette gave up her theater boxes. Louis XVI no longer went hunting anymore. And they made very few public appearances. Louis XVI could have taken advantage of all of this momentary goodwill that he had and taken a leadership role in the French Revolution. Now that he had agreed to the August Decrees and the future Constitution, which was still two years away from being finalized at this point, there was a huge amount of work to be done to make those decrees a reality. And instead, Louis XVI chose to play almost no role at all in the French Revolution. The people of Paris now had a greater influence in the National Assembly. Paris was the liveliest and most opinionated city in all of France. All kinds of groups and individuals came to petition the National Assembly on behalf of countless causes and needs and agendas. The October days also deepened the division between the left and the right in the National Assembly. Many monarchists quit the National Assembly in disgust. The patriots on the left were very happy with the October days, but the moderates were the biggest winners of all. A perfect example of this division was the Jacobin Club. Some patriots wanted to organize, and these patriots rented out the library of a Dominican monastery as a meeting place and they named themselves the Society of the Friends of the Constitution. And soon they had a new nickname, Jacobins. Dominican monks were commonly called Jacobins, and the right-wing press thought it was funny that this left-wing, anti-clerical group of revolutionaries met in a Dominican monastery. And so these journalists sarcastically called this left-leaning party the Jacobins. And the Society of the Friends of the Constitution liked the name Jacobins so much that they adopted it. You didn't have to be a deputy in the National Assembly to join the club. You just had to be able to pay the annual membership fee. And the Jacobins had lots of different kinds of members, merchants, bankers, writers, liberal nobles, priests, etc., the Jacobins met nightly to plan strategy for the next day's sessions in the National Assembly, and lots of people asked to come to their meetings and even speak. Many organizations sent delegations to them just like to the National Assembly, and the Jacobins soon got a reputation for being the voice of the people. A network of Jacobin clubs developed all over France, and by 1791, Paris, just Paris, had 50 different political clubs, including the Jacobins. By the end of the year, 1789 was becoming known as Year One of Liberty. 